Good morning. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God. For no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Now this guy, Nicodemus, was a Pharisee. He was also a member of Sanhedrin. Sanhedrin was basically a Jewish court, so of 70 odd members. So he was a member of that. So he was a ruler of that. That means he was a leader in Sanhedrin, which was a Jewish court. Now this guy is coming to Jesus by night. Why by night? There could be several reasons. One, uh, there is a possibility that he must have thought that uh, during the night, Jesus uh, would not be crowded with people. So he would get enough time to ask questions. Second, there is also a possibility since he was a member of Sanhedrin, uh, the Jewish high priest and all, they were against Jesus. But this man Nicodemus, he had a good heart. He was a man of truth. He could see some signs that Jesus was performing, some miracles. And he was sure that this man is from God. So, but he also worried about his own reputation. There is a possibility that if he comes and meets him during the day, he would be questioned by the Jewish court. That you are not supposed to meet a person who is giving heretical teachings. So, he decided to come in the night. So, there, there is a possibility either of these reasons would be there. So, he came, he was a rabbi. Rabbi means a teacher. Okay, so he was very honest in this. He did say that, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. So he was sure that this man, I mean, he is from God, you know. Jesus answered and said to him, most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. When I read this verse, you know, I was blown away. Why? Because when he said that unless one is born again, you know, this born again, was very mysterious to me. I said, what do you mean by born again? Because normally people on earth will never use this phrase. They don't know but what is it to be born again. Any human being cannot use this phrase. You must have heard about other religious leaders, you know, who started their own religions. Um, there are teachers, there are gurus today. But anyone here on earth who has a history that he existed, never mention these phrases born again because it doesn't make any sense someone who has come from above can only define what does it mean being born again because no one else can understand this obviously uh, nicodemus even though he was a rabbi that means he was a scholar he was a pharisee he knew the scriptures well but we will find out that even he did not understand this phrase very well so Jesus was, in a way, was a very clear, he simply said, very blunt, unless you are born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. And Nicodemus obviously would have thought, what does that mean? Because I, I'm, I'm a rabbi, come on, I know the kingdom of God. And he's telling me that unless you are born again, something which I've never heard before. So Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he is old? Very logical question, right? <laughs> and probably he was an old man already he was thinking about himself oh, how can i be born again my goodness i cannot enter the kingdom of heaven now so he was thinking in a fleshly manner can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born again so seems to be a weird question to ask to jesus who was performing these signs i mean you cannot mock somebody like this you know so i don't really know why he said this jesus answered most assuredly i say to you um, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. So I'm not going to get you into the exposition of water and spirit. That takes a long time. But you can simply understand being born in the spirit, not in the body, not in the flesh again. Okay. Um, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. There is a spiritual birth that Jesus was trying to explain to Nicodemus. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. We all know that. Like the baby is born, beautiful baby, Daniel is born in flesh, right? So we are born in flesh, of the flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit, S capital, we're talking of the Holy Spirit here. 
So wherever the spirit is S capital in the Bible is talking of the spirit of God. The small s is human spirit. So he says that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes and uh, you hear the sound of it, but cannot tell where it comes from and where it goes. So is everyone who is born of the spirit. Now Nicodemus was getting even more confused. He was not able to understand anything. You know, he was asking again, how can these things be? Jesus answered and said to him, are you the teacher of Israel? <laughs> and do not know these things. So Jesus was not mocking him, but reminding him that Nicodemus, you are the teacher of Israel. You know, you have been assigned a job to teach people about God and you don't know these things. In a way, that's kind of like telling him he should be knowing these things. You know, no one has ascended to heaven, but he who came down from heaven, that is the son of man, which is S capital. Wherever you see S capital, that is for Jesus, son of man. Okay, I don't know if it's in your Bible or not. Who's in heaven? And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness. Now, this is important. Why is he mentioning Moses of the Old Testament? Firstly, he was endorsing the Old Testament that whatever is written in the Old Testament, whether it's Adam and Eve, creation, or Noah's flood, Noah's ark, everything he's endorsing. And in many places, you will see quotes from the Old Testament scriptures. What does that mean? Sometimes you may doubt. I, I understand the New Testament. I understand that Jesus really came. But I don't really believe in the Old Testament because there are some fairy tales in that. But when Jesus endorses this by quoting from the Old Testament, what is it trying to imply? Guys, do not doubt. Every word written in the scriptures in the Old Testament is from God. It is accurate. Do not doubt if the science comes and tells you, no, 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 we were evolved out of what? Single cells, amoeba. Then our ancestors were apes. And then we became human beings. Do not believe because Jesus endorsed the Old Testament. So Jesus many a times endorses the Old Testament scriptures. So he said, and as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the son of man be lifted up. That whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. And then he comes to this verse, which everybody knows. What is that verse? Who will answer? Okay, I'll read it for you. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life, which is eternal life. Okay. So we stop here. Now, things that I would want to ask you is this. When he said to Nicodemus to be born again, which is the key of the gospel, right? Is the heart of the gospel. That's the key to be born again. So now who will answer me? What does that really mean? My name is Anand Gurung. And for me, what I think to be born again means to, uh, to, be, to have a different uh, nature. To when, when we accept Jesus Christ, then, to have, uh, then our hearts to be born into Jesus Christ, to be a new creation in Jesus Christ and uh, living, the, uh, living behind the past and living up the new life that Jesus has given us. So for me, being born again means to uh, be a new creation or to have a new heart in Jesus Christ. Very good. We can clap for him, first of all. So he gave a good answer. Okay. That's a new nature. You are a new creation. Okay. So this is what it says in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, that you are a new creation. That means you're not repaired with hammer and chisels, but you are altogether a new creation. That means you've been born again as a baby, but not in flesh, but in the spirit. Who else wants to add anything to this? Um, my name is Elizabeth. And so for me, what it uh, means to be born again, as an example I can give, which I have experienced in my life, is like um, before I was baptized, I mean, the fleshly way of showing that you've been born again is baptism. And it's like putting the old self behind and living the new creation which God has uh, given us the new life. And for me, it's like I experienced it when I uh, a few years back when I was living on my flesh before and like I was wanting to say what I want with my mouth and and be very emotional and stuff like that. But then when 
I realized that Jesus had given me a new life and he wanted me to live according to his word. Then I realized that I have to control my thoughts, control my desires and live according to the Bible and his word and leave my fleshly desires behind and take control of my spirit and my heart and live by the spirit and live according to what the scripture says and also live by the Holy Spirit and to manifest the Holy the work of the Holy Spirit that is in my that is uh, working in and through my life and also be focused on the things above. Okay, we can clap for her. So she gave a good answer. Anyone wants to add to this? Come on now, open up. Two people have already given good answers. My name is uh, Maya, and for me to be to be born again, for me it's like uh, being born. I can how we get baptized. It's like we're putting away our old self and when we're raised out of the water, it's like we're coming up into a new life with a new identity in Christ Jesus. And so that's that's what I understand being born again. It's like coming to a new life and with a new identity and knowing who we are in Christ and now allowing God and His Spirit to work in us. Very nice. Okay, clap for her. So what does it really mean to be born of the Spirit? You did mention about a new nature, a new creation, okay, new life, new experiences. You um, leave behind your fleshly life, fleshly desires and all, that's fine. But what does it exactly mean to be born of the Spirit? My name is Boaz Sarkar. And uh, also for me, what it means to be born of the Spirit is as uh, Romans 12 verse 2 says, being transformed by the renewal of your mind and so when we are changed in the spirit when we accept a new spirit then uh, we are our mind is uh, renewed and all the old thoughts the thoughts that were not of god all of that goes away and now our mind is completely focused on the things that are above to set our minds on things that are, that are above and so for me being transformed by the renewal of our mind is also one way that we are uh, changed in the spirit Platform. Very nice answer. Okay. Renewed by the Spirit. And he quoted a good verse from Romans 12 too. That's wonderful. Anybody else? Uh, I think being born of the Spirit is to, uh, when you are born of the Spirit, it is, I think, to uh, be putting down your flesh and letting the Spirit of God be the one that is taking full charge and to be the one that will be leading you in every decision of life that you make just as how it says in the uh, verses that the wind comes and it blows and you hear the sound but you do not know from where it comes or from where it goes and so it is with the spirit and so in that same way uh, we know when we are being led by the spirit because the presence of the lord is with us but we do not know up to what <clears throat> level he will take us and so uh, because we are not the ones leading, but it is the Spirit of God that is leading. And so when we are born of the Spirit, then it is a new it is a new experience that we receive that it is no longer us who is be, who is the one that is leading, but it is rather the Spirit of God within us working and manifesting more of His power through our lives. And so that is what I think it means. Brilliant answer. Okay. Applause. <coughs> right. Okay. Anybody wants to add to this? You're almost there. Most of the points have been covered. But is there anything else that you want to share? Uh, so um, being born in the spirit is from going from spiritually dead to being spiritually alive in him, in Jesus Christ. And also being uh, completely um, uh, living a life that is filled with the Holy Spirit is um, being baptized in, in the spirit, living a life that is surrendered to who, who he is and being led by the Spirit, as it says in Galatians, to live by the Spirit and to walk in the Spirit. So, yes. Excellent. Okay. So, Sabi added a good point there. We were spiritually dead. So, all your points were correct, but I'll come back to Sabi that she, what she meant was this. This is what the scripture says. In Ephesians 2, 1, all of us have a human spirit. The Spirit was given to us the moment we were born, like you have a soul. You also have a spirit. That spirit gives you the understanding of things. But our, our spirit, which uh, was meant to understand the things of God, that was why it was given. But it was dead. Why was it dead? Anybody? 
my name is Rachel and uh, the question is why is our spirit dead when we're born is because we haven't accepted Christ as our Lord and Savior so when we don't accept him then his spirit doesn't live in us but when we accept him his spirit lives in us and we can walk in the spirit okay we can clap for her uh, but it's not the complete answer come on guys why do we have a dead spirit when we are born um, my name is Shazang and so to this question yeah, to this question the answer is this what i see it is because a child is born yet he is innocent but we consider still consider that he is in sin because um, of our forefather like adam and eve when god had made a perfect world and they were without sin and god had created man to be be in relationship with him and be in communion and always stay with him enjoy his fellowship and when adam and eve they dis disobeyed god's command in the garden of eden god had told them to not eat from the tree of the good of uh, knowledge of good and evil and when they went against god's will and they sinned and due to that we every human being that is born was born with uh, sin nature and so even though if it, it's a child is the blood because of the sin nature is still carried out until a person is truly repentant and accepts jesus and jesus who takes away the our sins and gives us eternal life wonderful <laughs> okay okay so when adam and eve sinned um there was a fall in their nature and they had sinned for the first time so before that they did not know sin they did not have any negative thought in their mind you know uh, they had fellowship with god on a regular basis so all they knew was to have good fellowship with god that's it but they had this free will free will means what you've been allowed to decide for yourself and choose for yourself choose for your actions what you want to do and what you don't want to do why did God give us free will? Anyone? He knew that we are going to sin. <laughs> we are going to mess it up. So why did he give us free will? Uh, my name is Miana. And for me, uh, why God gave us a free will is because God, he loved us, that he gave his son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross so that we could have eternal life. So the answer is because Jesus, I mean, God, he loved us so much. So that's why he has given us a free will. Okay, we can clap for her, but we need to know some things more about free will. Okay, so like I think that uh, God gave humans a free will because he did not make us his puppets. He did not want us to believe in him just because he said so. He wanted us to, uh, he wanted us to truly believe in him, not only because he said so, but with our own will that we actually believe in him and we want to accept him as our uh, savior and our, as our God. Okay, that's good answer. You can clap for him. That is what it is all about. The love by definition has to include free will. Otherwise, it wouldn't be love. It would be programming. So when God had decided to create human beings, he did not want to program them. Like you program a, a software or a machine so that it works according to your whims and fancies. That means whatever you decide, the machine would do like this phone. So whatever has been programmed in this, it can only function that much. But that's not what God wanted to do with human beings. He wanted to give us free will so that we can approach him. We can come to him by our own will. That is love. That is true love. That is faith. So today you have a choice like Adam had to obey or disobey. Now disobedience is not a good choice, but you have a free will to do that as well. You're not programmed as robots or puppets okay so that free will was misused by adam when he did not obey one of his commands do not eat the fruit from the forbidden tree which he did and his wife okay so from then on he had this negative nature in him before that there was nothing negative in him so for the first time he experienced negative okay negative means sin so he experienced sin in his nature it became a part of his nature. So, when he produced his children, Cain and Abel, so that sin nature automatically, genetically transferred into his descendants. Like 
we have genetic transfer of your skin tone, your hair, your eyes, everything genetically transferred to the descendants. So the sin nature was genetically transferred to all babies of Adam and Eve and their further descendants, which means right from the moment we are born, we have a dead spirit, the spirit which was given to us to have a good understanding about godly things. That spirit is dead because of the sin nature that is genetically transferred to all human beings. So we believe in that because the Bible says so, that all babies have a sin nature. Most religions do not agree with that. They say no babies are innocent. We know that babies are innocent because they do not know about sin, but they still have a sin nature. And that little baby, his mother would find out soon that he also has a sin nature. Right when he's born, like one month, two months, but just by observing his nature, she will come to know that this child has a sin nature, a selfish nature. He just wants things for himself, his timings and everything. So that is a sin nature. And because of that sin nature, our spirit was dead when we were born. So now how do we communicate with God? How do we understand the things of God? As he mentioned about Romans 12, 2, the spiritual things. We did not have the discernment. We did not have the understanding until we were born again. Now comes the question, how can a person be born again? In other words, if somebody comes to you and says, brother, I want to be born again. How do I do that? So what would be your answer? And so we are born again when we accept the Lord Jesus Christ in our hearts and confess with our mouth that he is Lord, as it says in Romans chapter 10. So that's how uh, a sinner who is dead in the spirit becomes born again is when we accept Jesus. And when we accept him, we receive all that he has for us and all that is uh, that Jesus already had is with us. So we are born again that way. Okay, clap for her. Very nice. Okay, so how would you explain that in simple words? Anyone? First, we have to uh, accept that we are a sinner. Tell them that they are a sinner. And then we have to believe in Jesus and then confess that he is Christ. Excellent. Okay, that's a good answer. Yeah. How many of you think that you are sinners. I'm also raising two hands. One is for my wife. Okay. So all of us are sinners, right? We understand that. So we have to be humble enough to accept this fact. So you tell the person, okay, you want to be born again? There's only one way. Do you think you're a sinner? He says, well, yeah, maybe I've committed a few sins here and there. That's it. He says, like what? You ask him, like what? He may come up with something. You tell him what are sins. You know, say, say, have you ever lied in your life? He says, yeah, maybe just twice or thrice because they don't really remember their sins. So now you tell the person, if you think you're a sinner, you have a dead spirit. You do not have a relationship with Jesus Christ, the creator. Your sins needs to be forgiven and God has to declare you righteous. Only then can he have a relationship with you. So the obvious question is a man would say, how can my sins be forgiven? Who would answer that? My name is Stephen, and we can we have to repent to uh, repent to God that our sins are forgiven. Then He will forgive our sins, and we must believe it, and we must have faith that He will take away our sins, and we must have a new life again, because we sin, but then we should repent immediately so that God can forgive us. Okay, very nice. So that was a good answer. You need to tell that person, well, if you think you're a sinner, you need to repent from your sins. That means you have to have a desire not to associate with sin anymore. That is true repentance, which is called a U-turn. Okay. So if you say that you're sorry for your sins, it has to be sincere, which means you don't want to repeat your sins. You don't want to live in your sins. You want to lead a holy life now, you know, even though you have a sin nature, but your desire should be such that you do not want to commit any further sins. And you want to live a holy life as God says, you be holy as I am holy. So you tell that person, okay, now you need to know your creator and his rule book in order to understand what is holiness, what are sins. If you have the Bible, you can read from it. You can give him a Bible or you can tell him some stories from the Bible. Tell him that if you have the desire 
to live according to God's standards, that is holiness, and you do not want to commit the same sins that you have been committing all your life, then God will forgive your sins. You don't have to perform any rituals for that. But how is it that God would simply forgive him like that? Like in any court, let's say if somebody has committed a murder, you know, or any, any, any crime which is serious and is brought to the court and then he pleads forgiveness to the judge. He says, please forgive me. I'm sorry. I know that what I've done is wrong. Uh, please forgive me and I will not repeat it. And the judge can see his heart and says, okay, I think you're sincerely seeking forgiveness. So I forgive you. Now you're scot free. You can go home and enjoy your life. He says, what about the murder that I've committed? He says, okay, I've forgiven you. No problem. Go home. Would that be justice? My name is Boaz. And the reason why uh, letting the man murderer go would not be justice is because uh, once he committed the murder and he, if he is not punished for it, it will give him the uh, no, mo notion that if he commits murder again and confesses it ag uh, again and asks for forgiveness, he might get released. And so thereby uh, letting him go encourages that uh, uh, sin and uh, one makes him uh, will make him want to do it more very nice okay anyone else i think letting the murderer go would not be the correct uh, would not uh, just because if he uh, confessed it and so and if the judge let him go that would not be justice because uh, for every uh, sin for every wrongdoing there's a consequence there's a penalty to pay and so if he wasn't, so if he did not get the punishment, and so then that would not be justice. So that's why. Okay, so Anand was right. That that would not be justice. And the answers were given correctly by everybody. So this is what God says, like, you know, okay, he has committed a crime, uh, but he needs to be punished as well. That would, because there is a consequence to every sin. We may not realize the ripples. We commit a sin, we probably uh, say a small lie somewhere and we think it really is not going to harm anyone. But there are consequences to that which we cannot see every time. There are ripples like you throw a stone in the water. There are ripples. It always happens. There is always a consequence to sin. And that is why God says there has to be a punishment to justify that somebody has paid for that. Then the justice would be served, not otherwise. So a person cannot go scot-free just by saying, I'm sorry, even if he's sincere. The judge can say, okay, personally, I can see that you've become a good man now. I can forgive you. But you still have to serve the punishment. So he will sentence him to something, imprisonment or death or whatever. You still have to serve that. But in his heart, the judge has forgiven him. Same way God says that because all humans are sinners and they come to me with a repentant heart, I can forgive them and I can take them back to heaven as well. But somebody has to pay for all the sins they have committed in their lives. That was the question before God. How do I do that? Because what is the punishment for sin? Death, death in what sense? Is it just the physical death? Separation from God, which means ending up in hell. Okay. So there is a spiritual death and a physical death. Okay, so we are separated from God if we continue to live in our sin and we die in our sins. So that way we go to hell. But God doesn't want us to go to hell. He wants every person to be saved because of his love. So he made an arrangement for us. He says, okay, I'll pay for everybody's sins. That means I'll pay for everybody's debt on the cross. And I'll make it available for everyone. Whosoever wants to believe and accept that payment can receive eternal life, can receive forgiveness to sins. Okay. So he sent his son who came as man. His name was Jesus Christ. He died on the cross. You know the sacrifice story. There are historical evidences to that. So he died on the cross for whom? Was it for Christians? I think that, uh, not I think, but I, I know that it, God did not only uh, die or send his son to save christians but to save all because uh, first peter 3 verse 9 says that his will is not for none to, for 
all to perish, but for all to reach repentance. So when an unbeliever confesses and humbly comes before the Lord, then the word says that it's his will for all to reach repentance. So his death on the cross and his sending of his son, Jesus Christ, was for all, so that those that humbly come before him and acknowledges his name, that they will be saved. Very nice. Okay. Jesus died for everyone, regardless of religion, caste, creed, because God did not create any of those things. So God just says, you come to me with a repentant heart and I'll forgive you. But I will also pay for your sins. So he paid for everybody's sins. If we won't, we can claim it. Okay, God, you have paid for my sins, so I seek forgiveness. So I want to live with you forever. That's a simple sharing of the gospel. You tell the person, if you have a desire to repent from your sins, and if you have a desire to accept Jesus as your only Lord and Savior, because he created you, and if you have a desire to follow his word, then you're already forgiven. And to follow his word is the evidence that you have sincerely repented. You understand that? Let's say if somebody says, okay, I want to repent, but I don't really want to follow the Bible. I want to live my own life. Then that person has not sincerely repented. If he has repented sincerely, then he would want to follow the book. That is the word of God given to us. So that way you can share the gospel that your sins will be forgiven because Jesus has already paid for your sins. All your past sins, your present and future. He has already paid for the sins. But it is possible that you have a sin nature, so you may still commit sin sometimes, even though you don't want to. But you may get tempted sometimes, and you may make a mistake. All you have to do is to say sorry again, and your fellowship with Jesus would be restored. And until you say sorry, there will be no peace in your life. Even though you're saved, okay, but you don't have the fellowship with God. So it is good to say sorry and get back to God. But you have the power now. So what happens is when a man repents from his sins and accepts Jesus as his savior, what does he receive from God? Um, when a man ex uh, repents and accepts Jesus in his life, then he receives eternal life. That is the gift of salvation. And he receives the love of God and he walks according to the word. Okay, that's fine. He receives the love of God. Yes. What else? Uh, when we when we accept Jesus Christ, then we receive the Holy Spirit that lives within us. Wonderful. Okay. So that's good. God says, now that you have repented from your sins, I am going to bring into life your dead spirit. That will have life now. When God says life, he's talking about eternal life. There would be no death. So he says, I'm going to bring it alive now, that spirit of yours. Regenerate your spirit by the power of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit would come and dwell inside of you for the rest of your life. And Holy Spirit would teach and communicate with your human spirit every moment of your life. Why? So that he can keep you away from sins. And he can keep you oriented towards God all the time. So that is where you are born again in the spirit. So that is your new birth that Jesus was trying to explain to Nicodemus. He said, you have to be born again in order to enter the kingdom of heaven. So unless a man is born again of the spirit, the Holy Spirit gives life to your dead spirit. And your dead spirit is alive. Now, now you can understand the things of God easily. Before that, you were leading a fleshly life, influenced by the world system, influenced by Satan many a times. And then you would not have this discernment that what is right and what is wrong in God's eyes. Once you repent from your sins and you receive the Holy Spirit, that Holy Spirit starts educating your human spirit every moment and teaching you the things of God. And now you have that understanding. Now you have that wisdom because your human spirit is alive now, which was given to you to understand the things of God, but it was dead when you were born. Now that it has come back to life, you will start understanding the things of God. Uh, so being born again is something which only a repentant person can understand. Somebody who doesn't want to repent will never understand what is being born again. And this verse actually hit me so hard. And I said, this cannot be from a human understanding. This is, this is something from above. But there is a transformation. Now you have two natures. 
one nature was from Adam. That is the sin nature. You have two natures now. The other nature comes from God through the Holy Spirit. So you have two natures abiding in you. One is the sin nature, the other one is the godly nature. And this godly nature has to grow and this has to go down. This sin nature has to go down. How does that happen? By the word of God. This teaches you, gives you new understanding of things, new understanding about God every day. The more you read, the more you understand the scriptures, you grow this man. You're actually feeding the spiritual man now and your physical man is, is going down. So that is what it meant, being born again. So this class is over. If anyone wants to say anything about being born again that you've understood or you want to make a comment or something, you can raise your hand. What you were just talking about, it was nice hearing it. I mean, it's some, uh, it's encouraging and yeah, we can put, put it to practice. Just good hearing it. Okay. So I'm sure that God will bless you and bless many others through you in your life. Okay. So thank you, Jesus. God bless you.